My name is Ed Ott. I am a member of the faculty here at the Murphy Institute. Um, I am uh, delighted to see so many people here on a Friday afternoon. It's uh, unusual, actually, for me to be here on Friday afternoon as a member of the faculty. Anyway, <laughs> we do a lot of things here at Murphy, uh, but I think that this discussion, uh, which we are participating in, uh, it's not new to Murphy, uh, and it's not new uh, to the people in this city or this country, but I do think that the moment is new. Um, we now don't just get to talk about our issues. Uh, we now have to talk about how we take our issues and use them in the exercise of democracy because democratic institutions need to be defended. So in that sense, today, Murphy will continue its tradition of doing a little bit of democracy. We have gone through 40 years of wage suppression in this country actually a worldwide phenomenon. We have watched younger people, so-called millennials, be saddled with debt, precarious work, diminishing safety net, extraordinary rates of incarceration for men of color, suppression of basic rights as both humans and workers. Seniors, and I am one of them, wow. We started our life in a different world. We came out of a terrible, terrible period of two world wars and a depression. We watched a generation that fought to establish labor rights, worker rights, and attempt to create the highest standards of living in the world. We watched it go up and we have watched it be dismantled. As we go forward, we need to try to understand what's actually happening to us. We need to also understand why. The shift of wealth to the top, the greatest shift of wealth in this history of humankind, has created worldwide mass poverty. And we, in this country, are in danger of descending to it. Our little contribution to this um, is an attempt to fight back here. Uh, I have been honored uh, with my colleague, Ruth Milkman, to be part of a little bit of a study called Labor and Longevity, Unions in the Aging Workforce, which most of you have a copy here. If not, they're on the table in the back. Our first panel today, we will be joined by Kevin Stump, the Northeast Director of the Young Invincibles. It's a research and advocacy group which he will further describe when he's here. Our second discussant will be my colleague, Ruth Milkman. Ruth is well known uh, in labor and academic circles she has written many books. She is a world-class teacher and researcher. And her commitment to the issues that we work on here um, is just extraordinary. Uh, for me, for one, who came out of the Central Labor Council, Ruth brought me into the world of academia in a way I never thought I would be able to participate in. Uh, it's an honor to work with her. And uh, she will be our second discussant today. Uh, before I uh, ask uh, Kevin and Ruth to come up, I just want to make note that we are also joined by Nancy Condi, the uh, outre outreach director for Senator uh, Gillibrand. Um, and we are joined by Heya Yim, uh, the senior assistant from the city's Office of Labor Policy and Standards. So um, I want to welcome them here today and everyone else. Kevin, Ruth, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I know it's a hot Friday. Um, 
want to first thank the Murphy Institute and Ed for the introduction uh, and the Murphy Institute for having us. Um, big thanks to all of the co-sponsors of the event. This is a, this is a conversation uh, that started months ago to figure out how to bring together uh, millennials and baby boomers to understand what our shared challenges are, what our differences might be, and to figure out how to pave a path forward together, uh, especially in light of uh, the White House now serving more as a zoo than really <laughs> leading government. Um, OK, how do I, yeah. Um, so while we do that, uh, my name is Kevin Stump. As Ed said, I'm the Northeast Director of Young Invincibles. Um, we are a national nonpartisan policy research and advocacy organization that's working to elevate the voices of and expand economic opportunities uh, for today's young adult generation, also known as millennials. Um, to just kind of start, uh, just to, to kind of start, I want to first do a bit of definition on, um, you know, what are the generations? Um, you can see here the yellow uh, is millennials, the purple uh, is baby boomers. Baby boomers defined as 1946 uh, to 1964, millennials uh, born in 1980 to 2004. So it very slightly, if you ask the US Census or um, you know Pew or Young Invincibles, but generally it's 18 to 34 year olds. You'll see here that millennials make up the largest portion of the US population. Um, and we also make up the largest part of the workforce, but we'll get, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, we are the most diverse generation. Um, compared to uh, young adults in 1980, um, you can see here that the, you know, for those of you that may not be able to see it, um, the big blue uh, part of the circle here, the pie chart here, uh, is the white non-Hispanic population. Um, in 1980, it was 78%. In 2012, it was 58%. Uh, but the biggest takeaway here is the growth of young adult Hispanics, um, which has nearly tripled uh, since 1980 to 2012. Um, this is maybe a bit random for the flow of this presentation, but I thought it incredibly relevant and timely to share. You can see here that um, the uninsured rate since the Affordable Care Act has uh, really, really decreased. And in New York State, um, it's even lower than what the national average is. Um, so there's typically a 10% uh, difference between uh, young adults who are uninsured and the rest of the population. Um, and here we're looking at, a, in New York State, we're looking at a 15% uninsured rate for 18 to 34 year olds. Um, as I mentioned, young uh, millennials are the largest share of the workforce. Um, and if you remember the slide, uh, this slide before, you can see that we're the largest generation. So we're going to continue to be the largest part of the workforce. Um, and as uh, the economy continues to transition, as we start asking questions around what's the impact of the gig economy, what's the impact of things like automation, um, while we have a uh, post-secondary institution uh, infrastructure, a training and credentialing infrastructure that is built and designed for work today, we need to to increasingly be asking questions around how are we best setting up today's young adult generation to meet the demands uh, of tomorrow's workforce while maintaining a, not just a social safety net, um, but a number of other things that I'm looking forward to getting into on the panel. Um, I, I thought this to be a relevant point. Uh, this is from the Center for uh, American Progress. Um, but you can see here that uh, millennials today, about 6%, not even 6% of millennials um, are part of a union. Compared to uh, baby boomers when they were young adults, um, there were about 17% of uh, uh, baby boomers that were part of labor unions. Um, and that you know, is probably a larger conversation and another event in and of itself um, about looking at the increasingly um, unstable, insecure uh, workplace protections that we're facing. Um, uh, that our generation is really facing as we continue to become the largest part of the workforce and uh, begin our adult lives. Um, so, you know, we all know this. There are more people enrolled in college um, than ever before. Um, in 1980, there were about 26, 25% of young adult 18 to 24 year olds were enrolled. 
Um, today, it's closer to uh, 40, 44, 45 percent of females and 38 percent of males. In New York City, it's more than a 10 percent gap of young adults between gender. Um, and Ed, Ed, as Ed mentioned earlier, um, the gap is really from uh, black men and Hispanic men. Um, and so with more people graduating from college with an economy that increasingly demands some type of post-secondary credential. Um, we all know this student debt crisis um, has swept national headlines, um, but unfortunately, despite all of the hype and the talk and campaigning, there really hasn't been any progress to lower or to plateau student debt. And you could just see here the story is that student debt continues to rise, but not just total student debt, not just $1.1, $1.2 trillion, um, but the average amount that people owe is increasing year to year. I mean, in New York State today, it's more than $32,000 is the average student debt. Um, that's significant when you're starting your life um, making less money, being worth less, having less assets. Um, and so this is some research that Young Invincibles did a few months ago um, that looked at, uh, you know, young adults, uh, baby boomers when they were young adults, and young adults today. Um, and by every indicator, young adults today are worse off than their parents um, or than the baby boomer generation. Um, but the most compelling, uh, you know, finding is, is on income. And millennials earn less than boomers, period, at 20% less. Um, that's $10,000 less a year. This is a, re a, a reverse of what the American dream really should be. Um, so again, coupled with student debt, with lower incomes, what does this mean moving forward? Um, you know, not surprisingly, and there's probably too many things on here, but not surprisingly, um, we're not buying homes uh, as, as, uh, as much as our parents or the baby boomer generation. Um, and you can see here, 1989, 46% of young adults in 1989 were homeowners. Today, that's 43%. That's a 7% decline, further eroding uh, the economic security of our generation. Um, so again, all part of the same narrative and story here. Um, young adults have not fared. Uh, we have not benefited from a trickle-down economic policy, uh, as I don't think anybody in this room has. And if you did, maybe you can help donate to Young Invincibles and uh, continue to fund the work. Um, I thought this was interesting, and I'm looking forward to um, Ruth's point to talk about the gig economy. Again, this is a really um, you know, we use the word precarious, unknown, shadow economy, fringe economy, whatever we want to call it. There are more uh, questions than answers on the impact of the gig economy and who's using it, who's benefiting from it, and what that will ultimately mean moving forward when young adults are entering into an economy where they have to hobble together work that doesn't come with health care, doesn't come with pensions, doesn't come with employer-sponsored retirements. Um, so we really, uh, we really need to be careful and um, continue to ask questions about um, how to protect the economic security of young adults today as we move forward around the question of the gig economy. Um, and then finally, uh, I thought this was interesting, I was looking for the most up-to-date one, um, but uh, optimism is in decline, uh, which is a, a sad uh, way to end this presentation, I know. Um, but what I will say is that Given, and this was really something that started out of the Arab Spring, something that uh, was really a response to the Trump administration, young adults are taking to the streets. The millennial generation um, is a very politically charged and active generation. Um, you know, there's, I, I have a Google alert of millennial, and I dare you to do it for a day, because it is, um, you get two different things. One is how bad and terrible millennials are in the workplace, and the other is on how millennials will ultimately change the way we work, the way our economy works, um, and you know, society moving forward. So with that, um, thank you, and I'd like to introduce Ruth. Come on up. Not a millennial, so I need some technical assistance, please. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on this very warm day. I'm Ruth Milkman. I, like Ed said, I work here at Murphy, and I also teach at the Graduate Center. And I had the great pleasure of um, working with Ed on the report that um, you should have a copy of by now, or if not, pick one up on your way out. And I'm just going to give a kind of overview. OK, I need him to do this first. Um, so can you go to the beginning of that? This is it, but um, starting at the top, the slideshow. Thank you so much. Great. Can you hear me now? Yes. So um, we're just giving very quick overviews. And just in case, um, I guess you don't know this yet, after I finish speaking, we're going to have a short break. And then we're going to have a whole panel discussion, which Kevin and I will participate in, but with some other folks as well. So you're in for um, a lot of, and then there'll be time for everybody here to participate as well. So what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through some of the key findings of the report. And I threw in a couple other odds and ends as well. So my job is sort of the counterpart of Kevin's, only to talk about, well, I don't really call them aging boomers in this report, but the aging workforce, and with a particular focus on organized labor. How many people here are over 55? Yeah, that's what I figured. OK. Um, and how many people here consider themselves millennials? Just curious. Oh, good. So we, this is what we were dreaming of, is a, a shared audience of those two groups. OK. So. Um, you all probably know this first point, but I just want to remind you of it, and I'll show you a graph in a minute. One of the things that's amazing is that I guess I was really unaware of until Ed and I undertook this project, is that life expectancy has increased dramatically in the last century or so, and it's particularly so since the 1930s, which is when all our traditions and norms about retirement were established. It's almost a century ago, and yet we're still, you know, locked into that. Um, and this is something that uh, um, in, I, as an academic, I occasionally attend conferences where there are like management type. You know, this is the growing, booming sector of academia as people who are in business schools and whatnot. And they are very focused on this. But our side, the labor studies and labor movement, much less so. There's a lot of commitment to protecting Social Security, protecting pensions. But in terms of thinking about what are the social, social implications of this dramatic increase in life expectancy, organized labor really hasn't zeroed in on that. And our, the purpose of our report is really to hope that that, that will change. Um, older workers, as Kevin already showed you, are overrepresented young, among union members. And I'm going to give you a different graph that sort of slices that up a little differently. And the thing that's changed, of course, is that today many workers must work past the normal retirement age of 65 due to economic need. So this is, you know, the other, the flip side of what Kevin was talking about. Um, and I'll give you some details on that. Others want to continue working. They may not need the money, but, you know, they're going to live another 30 years in many cases, and they're interested in what they do, and they don't see any reason to stop. So that's a different phenomenon. Many of those folks don't want to work 80 hours a week, though. Or, you know, they want to work part-time, which in some professions means 40 hours a week, others less. Um, so then the other big news, which isn't really news to this audience, is that union members are way better off than non-union workers, not only during their careers, but when they retire, because they are much more likely to have traditional defined benefit pensions, which have basically collapsed in the non-union sector. Um, however, those pensions make the kind of part-time work toward the end of a career phase retirement much more difficult, as I'll explain. OK, so here's a chart of life expectancy from 1850 to 2010. And you can see it's basically a straight line up. And even with all the news about the opiate epidemic, which I don't mean to minimize, that is sort of a blip. Look at the graph where there's that flat line about almost halfway through. That's the influenza epidemic of World War I that some of you, I'm sure, are aware of. So that, that did slow the increase in life expectancy, but then it picked right up again, and I predict that will happen again. Um, here is the most important graph in the report, the shifting composition of pensions. So I don't know if you can see it in the back, but um, this shows the change in the uh, size of the workforce that has um, defined contribution pensions, which means basically 401ks, or the equivalent in the um, public sector and those who have defined benefit plans. So you can see that the share of um, people in uh, defined benefit plans, the, I'll just say the good pensions, has declined from 65% to 16% in just since the 70s. 
And meanwhile, the other one goes up, but a lot of people don't contribute to those 401k, so they essentially have very little at the end of their work careers in the, in the, by way of pensions. Um, and then this is the other chart about union density. This is not um, people when they were the same age, but just today, workers 16 to 24, 4% are organized into unions or union members, 10% for, you can't hear me still? All right, I gotta stay closer to the mic, is that better? Okay, you can see the chart, all I'm doing is summarizing it. So the, basically the older you are, um, there's one right there, you can't see it? I'll walk you through it. It's also in the report, so you'll have it to take home, you don't need to write this down or anything. Um, about 4% of very young workers, 16 to 24, are union members. About 10% of those 25 to 34, for the 55 to 64 year old group, it's 14.3%, which is the highest here. And I'll, if I have time, I'll tell you more about um, the 65 and over group, where it's actually lower for a lot of interesting reasons. I only have five more minutes, so I'm going to speed this up. Okay, why are union members older than non-union members? One reason is simply that turnover is lower in unionized jobs because they're better jobs. They pay more. You're less likely to quit. You're also less likely to be fired because you have a union protecting you. Um, and there is more protection of job security generally in union jobs, but particularly important for this population is protection from age discrimination, which is rampant in this country, although it's illegal and has been for half a century. It's very widespread. It's not very well documented. I think this is, anybody in the room who's looking for a research project, this is a good one. There's one audit study, do people know what that is, where you um, send in fake resumes for jobs and see who gets calls back, called back? It was only of women, but in that study, younger workers were 40% more likely, or in some groups even higher, to be offered interviews than older workers. Really? 10, 10 minutes? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. How did that happen? I, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, also, organizing among younger workers on the part of unions is very limited. One person we interviewed for the study, Ed and I, said, when I organize a new shop, the most drastic thing I notice is age. In non-union shops, people are in the early to mid-20s, maybe 30s, whereas her union members are way older. Um, and that's even more true in New York City. As you may know, here in New York, um, union density is roughly double the national level, and it's even more top-heavy in terms of age than in the country as a whole. Um, okay, so I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there's so little time. It's all in the report. Um, most union, the reason density drops after age 65 is that most um, union members can retire with a real, with a decent pension. Not everybody, but the vast majority can, and so they're not likely to be in the labor force at all, and if they are, they're in some new job, not the one that they were in when they were union members. There are exceptions, that in the non-union sector more generally, um, this is not the case, as I already tried to say. One of the labor organizations we did an interview at, which is not a traditional union, but a worker center made up of independent contractors, and the organizer's comment was, the retirement plan for our members is death. I know that's sort of grim, but that's how it is if you don't have a pension plan. Social Security is not enough, and not all of them even had that, because this was an industry where there were a lot of immigrant workers. Um, so as I already mentioned, pension rules often make face retirement difficult or impossible or anyway, crazy. Because a typical defined benefit program, the benefit is based on your last few years of employment. So if you decide you're going to work half time those last few years, you're, you know, cutting yourself, uh, you're cutting your pension in half. Nobody's going to do that. Um, and the jobs that older workers, by older now I mean 65 and up, do work in are seldom unionized. A few examples. Self-employment, selling real estate, basically completely non-union. Also, religious organizations employ a lot of older workers for reasons best known to them. Um, so on the contingent, so-called contingent work, which is not just the gig economy, what Kevin mentioned, but also um, temp workers, on-call workers, contract workers, freelancers, um, older workers are highly overrepresented in that population, according to a um, recent study by uh, Harry, uh, not Harry, sorry, Larry Katz and Alan Kruger, these uh, two very um, well-known economists, they found that 24% of workers over 55, their category was 55 to 74, were in these kind of jobs, much higher than for the prime age workforce, um, 25 to 40, 
sorry, 54 years old, 14% of whom were in those jobs, or younger workers age 16 to 24, only 6% were in those jobs. And not only that, but the growth in these um, types of jobs was sharpest for workers over 55. In other words, between 2005, the last time there was a survey of this kind, and 2015, the big increase was in this older group. And um, by the way, the gig economy, even though it's in the news every day, you'd get even more hits if you did the Google search for that than for millennials, I think. Um, that's, according to this study, was less than 1% of the entire workforce at that time. So it's, you know, it is growing very fast and it's in the news, but these other kinds of um, alternative work arrangements, is the euphemism, are much more common. Um, and, oh, sorry, and um, I think what's going on here is this. Again, it's hard to prove this and nail it really down. Um, there is so much age discrimination that if somebody loses an a ordinary standard kind of employment job at an older age, say 50 and over, it's very hard for them to get back into the standard kind of workforce. Very few employers are going to hire someone that age. Some people get lucky, but there's tremendous discrimination against those workers. Employers, incorrectly in my view, believe that younger workers are more with it, they're more energetic, they're more skilled, et cetera. And maybe that's true in some jobs, but um, older workers have many virtues that are not appreciated by employers, and they also tend to cost more. So there's a lot of age discrimination out there faced with that. People turn to these alternative work arrangements is what I think is behind these numbers. Um, this also shows you that the economic vulnerability of older workers in terms of which jobs they work in. This one is not in the report. I didn't come across this till more recently than when we put that to bed. Um, so you can see here that, or maybe you can't see it, but the, the older you are, the more represented you are in the occupations that you know, labor force projections say are going to shrink over in the future. So that's not good either. Um, I'm going to skip some of this about the labor movement. It's all in the report. Let me just um, say that what we found in our study was that there was a lot of variation among unions in the extent to which they were addressing these issues. That means both in terms of um, helping their members uh, make the transition to retirement. Some unions, especially in the public sector, were very hands-on about that. They would have workshops that were very detailed, offering a lot of financial and other counseling. And, and the other counseling is very important. Um, let me actually go back to one of these I skipped. Um, it's one of our informants said, it's not just pension and benefit counseling. We also ask, what are their dreams? What are their aspirations? I ask them, prospective retirees, do you have a plan to stay alive once you retire? Because people don't always think about that. They may hate their job and they want to get out, but they, you know, what are they going to do? They were used to working every day, and then suddenly they wake up and there's nothing on their schedule. This is an important issue. So some unions are dealing with that. Many are not doing anything. Um, okay. And the other thing is that um, the there's a lot of variation in the extent to which unions keep in touch with members after they retire. Some unions do basically nothing along those lines. It's like goodbye and good luck. Maybe they'll invite them to a picnic. Um, others are very committed to recruiting older members, in, um, retired members as, as active members, working on political projects, get out the vote, supporting campaigns, et cetera. Um, and that's the variation. The other thing that they, some of, I'll just close with this, that many, and this is in the report too, that um, some of the union staffers that we interviewed pointed out is that political education for retired members is really important because, as they said, otherwise you're going to believe everything you hear on Fox News, right? We, nobody else is educating them and that the union has a responsibility to do that, but not all unions are stepping up to that, so we think many more should. So I'm going to just stop there.